Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 75 of Guyton and Hall's Medical Physiology textbook. In this chapter we're going to go over endocrinology, or at least the basics of endocrinology, going over the various hormones and the basic mechanisms of how they actually cause an effect in the cell. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. So first we have to actually identify what different chemical messages are. So we have six different types listed here. We're only going to really focus on the endocrine and neuroendocrine hormones during it this unit but we'll go through each one anyway so neurotransmitters uh, the chemicals that are released from the axon terminals as we have discussed in the neurology unit and they act locally to then send another nerve impulse. Endocrine hormones are chemical messages released by glands or specialized cells that actually get released into the circulating blood. So they'll go around the body and affect a cell somewhere distal to where the gland is that's secreting the hormone. Neuroendocrine hormones are similar except for the hormone is not secreted from a gland rather it's secreted by an actual neuron. So instead of that neuron secreting a chemical that's acting locally, this neuron is secreting a hormone that's going into the blood and influencing a cell further around the body. So that is a neuroendocrine hormone. And then we get these other types of chemical messages. So paracrines are chemical messages that are secreted by cells that affect neighboring cells nearby. Whereas autocrines are secreted by cells, but then automatically just go back and influence itself. So it's secreting its own substance that's going to influence its own function. And then cytokines are peptides that are secreted by cells and they can have really a function as an autocrine, paracrine, or endocrine hormone. So the common cytokines are our interleukins and our lymphokines. And we have also talked about the cytokine hormone leptin, which is an adipokine. So so if we talk about hormones specifically, we do have three different types of hormones. We've got one is proteins and polypeptides. Polypeptides is just a smaller protein. They make the definition here of having less than 100 amino acids to make it a polypeptide or just purely a peptide. And then to be a protein, you need it greater than 100 amino acids. And these are the majority of our hormones. So we have insulin and glucagon secreted by the pancreas all the hormones mainly secreted by the anterior and posterior pituitary gland, the parathyroid hormone, and many others as well. So the majority are proteins slash polypeptides, and we'll dive into more detail very shortly about those ones. But our other two types of hormones include steroids. So steroids are released from the adrenal cortex, and the example there is cortisol and aldosterone, and then also our sexual hormones as well. So estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And then we have our last group here of hormones, which are derivatives of the amino acid tyrosine, so our amines. And this includes the thyroid hormones, and then also epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are also secreted from the adrenal medulla. So as far as we know, there are no polysaccharides or nucleic acid hormones. Rather, there's an amino acid derivative, there's a steroid, and then there's protein and polypeptides. So you can see here table 75.1, it goes through every single or a large majority of the hormones that we will actually cover in this unit. So eventually you'll get to know every single one of these and where it's secreted and what its function is. And then as at the end here, you can see what its actual chemical structure is. And you can see that the majority of them are peptides. We've got the occasional amine and steroid as well. So to dive further into each of these, we'll start with our proteins. So proteins and polypeptides, these are water-soluble molecules which can be stored within the cell. So it starts off with the production at this rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, that's where proteins are made on the endoplasmic reticulum because ribosomes are on the ER. So these ribosomes are creating the proteins which initially are not biologically active. They're actually called pre-prohormones. And eventually these actually get cleaved into prohormones in the endoplasmic reticulum before getting further processed in the Golgi apparatus that creates these secretory vesicles that eventually breaks down the prohormones into the active hormones. And then they can be stored in these secretory vesicles within the cell waiting for a signal to then release them. So the cell is able to release these hormones 
hormones right away. As soon as the stimulus comes, it binds to the receptor and then typically it's an, either an increase in calcium within the cell or an increase of the secondary messenger CAMP that causes these secretory vesicles to then release the hormone via exocytosis. So that's how proteins work and remember they're water soluble so they can't actually cross the membrane. They will typically just find its receptor on the cell surface. Now steroid hormones are different uh, because they are actually made out of cholesterol. So they're very similar to cholesterol, which makes them lipid soluble. That means that the lipid soluble steroid hormones can actually enter the cell and then influence a receptor or bind to a receptor within the cell itself. But that is a double-edged sword. So even though they can get right into the cell to then bind to the receptor, as soon as they're made, they can easily diffuse out of the cell that created them. So instead of creating a lot of steroid hormones and keeping them stored, Stored. Instead, the cells will have a large store of cholesterol, will then be used to create the steroid hormones and then be released into the blood. And since they are lipid soluble, they usually travel in the blood bound to proteins. So then they're not able just to diffuse into every single cell. And because they are lipid soluble, they are usually bound to plasma proteins whenever they are circulating within the blood. So then lastly here, we have got our amine hormones that come from tyrosine. Now example of this was our thyroid hormone, which gets produced in the thyroid gland. And that actually gets incorporated into these larger molecules called thyroglobulin, which is the store of thyroid hormones. And then once the signal comes along, that will then release the free hormone from the thyroglobulin to then get released into the bloodstream around the body. When it comes to the catecholamines, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, which are our amines, they actually get produced and then taken up into vesicles, very similar to the proteins and peptides, and then stored until they're going to be released due to a various stimulus. So these ones are also stored waiting for release, whereas the steroids, they are not stored, rather there is a storage of cholesterol to then create the hormone. So then that gets to the next point here, which is the actual secretion of hormones, how it's transported around the blood, and then the clearance from the blood. So the very important point about hormones is that they are very specific for certain receptors, and then those receptors will be only found on certain cells, and then the certain cells with the receptors need the appropriate machinery within the cell to actually cause the effect. So just because you have hormones around your body, not every single cell is going to respond to that. They need the receptor and they also need the intracellular machinery to create the effect that the hormone is trying to do. So these hormones have their own characteristics and usually their concentrations are so low in the bloodstream because once that cell has a receptor and has the intracellular machinery, it binds to the hormone and then creates a cascade effect to then create the effect. And this cascade effect kind of amplifies the effect from the hormone. So you only need a small amount in the blood to create a relatively large effect. Now this entire system is obviously under a negative feedback control system. So the increased release of a hormone will then create a variable that then will then stimulate the reduction in the release of the hormone. Just like all the systems that we always talk about, there's always this negative feedback mechanism. There is an example of a positive feedback mechanism here with luteinizing hormone causing the release of estrogen and the estrogen being present then stimulates additional LH being released. So there is a positive feedback here where luteinizing hormone increases itself, but there once again is this overarching negative feedback that once LH reaches the concentration that it needs, there is then a negative feedback system to bring it back down. It's the same with coagulation. That is a positive feedback system to cause clotting, but there's an overarching negative feedback loop to then actually control the clotting in the end so it doesn't actually spiral out of control. And we talked about that way back in the original chapters. And then there's also a cyclical variation in our hormone release. So there's changes in hormone release with seasons, with diurnal or daily cycles, sleep, aging, you know, all these little other factors which influence each hormone as well. So it's not a simple recipe of A equals B. There's all these variables that we have to take into account with negative feedback, positive feedback, seasonal changes, daily changes, 
etc. So the actual transport of hormones in the blood, we've talked about this briefly, water-soluble hormones, so the peptides and the catecholamines, they're actually dissolved in plasma. So then they are able to transport around the circulating blood and then interact with the receptors on the cell membrane. Whereas steroid and thyroid hormones, they actually circulate in the blood being bound to plasma proteins. And that actually creates a relative store of these hormones within the circulating blood. Whereas the water-soluble hormones, since they're not bound to anything, they get rapidly cleared in the blood. So they go around, quickly do their effects, and then they're rapidly cleared. Whereas the steroid and thyroid hormones, which are bound to proteins, that almost protects them from these clearance mechanisms. So they actually linger in the blood a little bit longer, slowly being released from the plasma proteins to cause their effect. So there are really two factors that influence the concentration of hormones in our blood. The rate of hormone secretion and then also the rate of removal, both of which are pretty simple to understand. If you produce more hormone, you're gonna have higher concentrations. If you remove it faster, you're gonna have lower concentrations. Now the metabolic clearance rate influences our rate of removal. So the metabolic clearance rate is just equal to the rate of disappearance of the hormone from the plasma divided by the concentration of the hormone. So obviously if you have a faster rate of disappearance, you're gonna have a higher metabolic clearance rate. But if you have a higher concentration of hormone, it's gonna take longer to get rid of that hormone, so our metabolic clearance rate reduces. So how do these hormones actually get cleared from the plasma? We have four main mechanisms outlined here. We've got metabolic destruction by the tissues, We've got the binding with the tissues, so then it just takes it up, takes it out of the circulation. We've got excretion by the liver into the bile, and then lastly, excretion by the kidneys into the urine, all of which are rather self-explanatory. So they're either destroyed, taken up and used, or they're excreted via bile and in the feces or in the urine, our two main excretory pathways. So next up is talking about the mechanisms of action of our hormones. So in order for the hormone to actually cause an effect, it needs to first bind to a receptor. Now these receptors may be found on the surface of the cell membrane, which is mainly our proteins and catecholamines, or our water-soluble molecules, which actually bind to these outer receptors. And then we have some receptors which are within the cell cytoplasm, and that is where our steroid hormones come in because they can actually dissolve straight through that cell membrane, being lipid-soluble. And then lastly here, within the cell nucleus itself, and this is actually how thyroid hormone acts. It goes right into the cell nucleus, tells the cell nucleus to produce a lot of different metabolic proteins and enzymes to then increase overall cell metabolism. Now the number of receptors present can really determine how sensitive the hormone is going to be to create an action. So we can have down regulation of receptors, meaning that there's less receptors available which will then result in a reduced response to a hormone. And that can occur for five reasons outlined here. So an inactivation of some receptor molecules, so antagonism of the receptor. Number two is an activation of the intracellular protein signal molecules. So there is a receptor, but that signal is not getting passed on to the downstream effects. Number three is the temporary sequestration of the receptor inside the cell. Number four is destruction of the receptors by lysosomes. And then number five is just decreased production. So this is down regulation, reduced response to a hormone. Whereas up regulation, so increased receptors, will then result in a more sensitive stimulating effects to the hormone. So what happens after that hormone's actually bound to the receptor? Now that really depends on the type of receptor that's present that has bound. And these alter per hormone, per receptor, but if we go through the general groups here, we have iron channel linked receptors, which we've talked about mainly in our neurology units. That's mainly where these ones are present, which respond by opening up an iron channel. So a substance or a chemical messenger comes in, binds to the receptor, which then opens an ion channel. And that allows the propagation of action potentials across a synapse. That does happen with our endocrine hormones, but usually it's coupled to a G protein. Now, that is the next type of receptor that we're going to talk about here. So G-protein-linked hormone receptors are these ones outlined in figure 75.4 here. So you can see that it's this transmembrane receptor, which is this protein molecule that makes these seven 
loops back and forth that has the little receptor on one end and then it has this little, little finger that binds to either GDP when it's inactive or GTP when it's active. And then this activation occurs due to the hormone binding to it. And then this effect of having GTP attached to the protein all depends on the next step. And there are various next steps that can occur. It can activate an enzyme to then create another secondary messenger. It could activate an ion channel and open that ion channel so ions can now move through. So this activation of a G protein then results in a secondary effect to then create the message that we would like. The next type of hormone receptor is an actual enzyme-linked hormone receptor, which sounds similar to what we're just talking about with the G proteins, but there is no G protein here. The receptor itself is an enzyme which then catalyzes a reaction to create a response within the cell. Whereas the G protein is more of a lever to then create another response, which may be the activation of another enzyme, but it's slightly different to the enzyme-linked hormone receptors because these guys do not involve that G protein. So one of the main enzyme-linked receptors is the tyrosine kinase, with one example being Yanis kinase or JAK, JAK2. So JAK2 is a type of tyrosine kinase which catalyzes a reaction to create activated STAT proteins. As you can see here through the phosphorylation, it creates activated STAT proteins which then get into the target cell nucleus and then target gene to create a response. Now the JAK-STAT pathway is important because this is actually one of the signals that promotes growth of a cell and is actually one of the targets for certain chemotherapeutic agents as well. But that's starting to dive too deep for this certain textbook. Now the other type of enzyme which is very very common is adenylcyclase which is also linked to G proteins as well and that creates CAMP from ATP or cyclic adenosine monophosphate and CAMP is is a secondary messenger that goes around within the cell to create multiple effects, usually phosphorylating a certain protein kinase, which will then catalyze further pathways to then increase the response. So one little receptor being bound results in more CAMP being produced, which will then phosphorylate enzymes within the cell to catalyze multiple equations. So you can see this cascading effect that occurs. Now one that's very similar to CAMP is cyclic guanosine monophosphate or CGMP. And that's what some other peptide hormones such as atrial natriuretic peptide does to cause its effect. Remember atrial natriuretic peptides are released from the heart due to excessive stretch to tell the kidneys to produce more urine. Now those are our receptors which are on the cell membrane surface. But then we also have these intracellular hormone receptors. And this is where the lipid soluble guys come in, bind to the receptor, which activates a promoter sequence within the DNA to then produce a certain protein through transcription. Transcription goes to translation. Translation produces the protein molecule that the hormone was wanting to produce. Now there's a little portion here about secondary messengers. So these are the guys that get produced after the receptor has bound to a hormone. And then that secondary messenger within the cell goes and creates other effects within the cell, that cascading response. So CAMP is one of these guys, one of these second messengers, and that gets created because adenylcyclase converts ATP into CAMP. Now, adenylcyclase may be linked to a G protein, which makes that G protein now a G little s protein or a G stimulatory protein to then activate that CAMP. CAMP then goes off and usually activates those protein kinases that I talked about previously to then create a specific action. Now CAMP itself does not create a specific action. It just depends on the machinery within the cell. So within the actual thyroid gland, CAMP will stimulate the formation of the thyroid hormones. Whereas CAMP within the adrenal cortical cell will result in the secretion of steroid hormones. And then CAMP within the collecting tubules of the kidney will increase the permeability to water. So it really depends on what the cell function is and what machinery is within it, which will determine what CAMP does. So CAMP itself is really just a messenger saying, okay, increase your activity. And then whatever machinery is within the cell will then increase 
increase its activity. So that's one of the main secondary messages. Another one here involves the phospholipid system. So instead of adenylcyclase being activated, we get the activation of phospholipase C. Phospholipase C then promotes the breakdown of PIP2 into either IP3 or DAG. Now, IP3 and DAG are the secondary messengers. Phospholipase 3 is just that enzyme on the cell membrane. So phospholipase C is equivalent to adenylcyclase, whereas IP3 and DAG are equivalent to CAMP. Now, IP3, one of its main roles is to actually mobilize calcium and then actually end up with smooth muscle contraction and changes in cell secretion. Whereas DAG, a portion of it is actually arachidonic acid. So remember, that is the precursor to a lot of our pro-inflammatory molecules or our prostaglandins. So that promotes inflammation. And then our last secondary messenger system that gets mentioned here is the calcium calmodulin system. So calmodulin is a secondary system and it requires the binding of calcium to it to become activated. So calmodulin sitting within the cell, once there's an influx of calcium enough to bind to it and activate it, the activated calmodulin then goes on and either activates or inhibits protein kinases within the cell, depending on what's present. So one of the main calmodulin secondary messages we've already talked about way back in our muscle chapter, which is the calmodulin that activates myosin-like chain kinase to then cause smooth muscle contraction. And then this last portion here talks about how the actual hormones enter the cell, how they create their functions. And we've briefly talked about this already. But starting off with our steroid hormones that get within the cell, bind to the receptor, this receptor protein hormone then gets transported into the nucleus that then binds to certain areas of the DNA strand, activates the transcription process of specific genes, mRNA leaves the nucleus to then promote translation using ribosomes to create new proteins. So this is obviously a slower system here because you're actually involving the DNA to come out and then produce a protein, etc. But this is how aldosterone works within the kidneys. It goes within that renal tubular cell, it eventually tells the DNA to produce a certain protein and that protein goes to the cell surface and then actually helps with sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. And that's how aldosterone works as a sodium retainer, but then a potassium secretor. And since it takes a while, this effect is delayed for 45 minutes or up to several hours or even days. So that's steroid hormones. Thyroid hormones, they get right into the actual nucleus itself and increase transcription of specific genes. These genes then create proteins and then these proteins are basically our metabolic proteins and enzymes. So then our metabolism virtually increases in every single cell. And that's how thyroid increases metabolism. There's a little portion here about how to actually measure hormones using radioimmunoassays and ELISAs, but I won't go into too much details there. If you need to learn that, I encourage you just to read it. Otherwise, here's a few questions for you. Number one, name a lipid-soluble hormone. Number two, name a secondary messenger. Number three, list the three types of hormones. And then number four, define an endocrine hormone. I'll post the answers in the description. Feel free to comment your answers or start a discussion. If you want to support the channel for the price of a coffee a month, you can do so through the Patreon link, which helps support this small channel and help it grow. But I know what it's like to be a student. So if you can't afford that, that's definitely okay. I want to at least make this video content free on YouTube, which I hope you've enjoyed and we'll see you in the next chapter.